I've been thinking uh, about this this time right now, this period of time, this winter season, especially, as a kind of microcosm of the Buddha's life mission. Not following? Okay. Well, last month we celebrated the Buddha's Enlightenment Day, right? That was early in the month. And then next month, what day are we celebrating? One of the three important Buddhist holidays is the Nirvana Day. Nirvana Day is the day that the Buddha, of his Buddha's death, or the cessation of his physical existence. So, if we look at it in this way, from the moment of his enlightenment to his death, the Buddha spent his whole energy, every waking hour, focused on spreading the Dharma. That was his life mission, the mission of spreading the Dharma. And he did so for over 50 years, going around by on foot throughout India, sharing this message. And that message was, ultimately, right, how to become a Buddha. Now this was not something new that he just came up with. He was basically sharing his enlightenment over this whole 50 year span. Everything that he had become enlightened to, he took it and broke it up into different teachings. And then with those different teachings, he found very skillful means of expressing those teachings to as many people as possible. That was his goal, reach out to people. And as I said, that central focus, how to become a Buddha. How do I become a Buddha? Now, I know it's a very difficult concept to grasp, I think, for a lot of people. What does it mean, becoming a Buddha? Well, becoming a Buddha really means being able to see what the Buddhists could see. see through the eyes of the Buddha. Right. So, becoming a Buddha is, it basically means to become awakened to the Dharma, right? If we recall, at the Buddha's enlightenment, at the moment of his enlightenment, he sat there, and all of a sudden, he became awakened to the truth. And he could see that everything around him was shining shining with this pure light, which we know as the Buddha nature. Everything had this Buddha nature. He said everything was perfect just as it was. The only problem was that we couldn't see it. And because we were so consumed with our own illusions and attachments to things, we couldn't see our true natures. And so the Buddha made it his own personal quest to reach out and share to everyone about their true natures. Of course, it took a very long time. And it was below from the Lotus Sutra. It wasn't until almost 50, the 50th year, about 48 years later, that he finally revealed that each one of you has the Buddha nature. So, this idea, right, that each one of us has a Buddha nature, it's very difficult, I think, for a lot of people to grasp. And that's why it took so long for the Buddha to really ex expound. So, inherently we're perfect. We have this perfect, perfectness to us. However, you know, it's, it's, the Buddha wasn't saying that we're already perfect. We're already fully realized Buddhas, exactly. No, no, he says, our ultimate, our fundamental nature is perfect, but we have to cultivate. We have to cultivate. And why? Because we have those layers that cloud over it, right? Those layers of attachment, greed, anger, delusion, or ignorance, I should say. All of that clouds over it. So it's not just about realizing that, oh, I'm perfect, I'm the Buddha, okay, I'm good. No, no, I have to do the work. I have to do the work of actually removing all of that. We call that in Kose Kai, cultivating our Buddhist heart, cultivating our hearts and minds. 
So, if, though, we weren't, we could see things in a different way, right? In my perspective, I don't see like that. I see just what's in front of me, right? Like I have blinders on, only seeing this very superficial nature of things. But if I were to put on the Buddha's glasses, right? put these on, I can see, I can see your true nature shining through. Right. So, where do we get these glasses? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they don't sell these at Walmart. You know, I, yeah. These glasses, they come to you through your practice naturally. As we practice daily, our vision changes. And eventually, we just find these glasses sitting down, we put them on, and we're able to see reality. So the Buddha's whole enlightenment was really about seeing the reality of things, recognizing that things change, and more importantly, recognizing that things are, I should think, more important, but equally important, that everything is interconnected. Right? That's the Buddha's enlightenment. So being able to see all that, that's what makes you a Buddha. Right? So, to become a Buddha, once again, is to be able to see things, everything, as the Buddha. And being able to see the Buddha in ourselves as well. So, the Buddha teaches that there's two selves in each of us. Two selves, okay? One self is called the apparent self, or we can call it the ego. It's what we see in front of you. It's me. All right. And the second self is what we call our true self, the Buddha self, our Buddha nature. As I said, we're already Buddhas by nature. That's where that term comes from. But it's deep within. And after we're born into this world, we forget about it. We forget our true nature. And of course, through various experiences, all of these other ideals, especially the idea of dualistic thinking. This is me, that is you, right? Us, them, black, white. All of this vision, it changes. And we cease to, to see ourselves as one with all beings. So, what Dogen was saying, I have to bring up that quote from Dogen says, that to know Buddhism is to know the self. And to know the self is to forget the self. So what we're saying, forgetting the self, we're forgetting our small self, that apparent self, that we think is somehow permanent. Right? We know it's not. It's that small self that we're trying to let go of so that we can become aware of our true, bigger self, the self that is interconnected with the Buddha. Let's just think about it, though. Think about ourselves. We rely on natural things to live. We don't make anything on our own. Nothing. This is what it means to be caused to live by the Buddha. This is interdependency. Let's take, for example, the relationship between humans and plants. Okay. We breathe in oxygen released by plants, and in turn, we exhale carbon dioxide, which the plants absorb. We both need each other. This is a kind of symbiotic relationship here. And this is just one type of interdependent relationship of this universal life force. And all of these are parts of the Buddha. In the Meditation Sutra, the sutra at the end, the kind of closing sutra to the Lotus Sutra, it says, closing my eyes, I see the Buddhas. But when I open my eyes, I lose sight of them. Closing my eyes, I see the Buddha. But when I open my eyes, I lose sight of them. Every time I think about this, I remind, it reminds me of this experience I had 
when I was in Japan, I was climbing this very sacred mountain there, and uh, as a kind of a pilgrimage. And I was asked to be one of the leaders of this expedition of sorts. And just like any kind of you know, leadership role, you, know, you have to plan, right? So I, I was with this group of a few people, and we had to plan how we were going to do it. The first thing that we had to come up with was a slogan. What was going to be our, our kind of slogan that we were going to keep in mind throughout this whole, uh, you know, very difficult climb. It took two days, no, three days, two nights and three days. And so we really had to be prepared for it. Um, plus, at the same time, we would be beating on drums and chanting the daimo the whole time. So uh, we chose this phrase, this is, Ishin yoku kenbutsu, which means, wish with all my heart to see the Buddha. So chapter 16, you know that phrase, to wish with all our hearts to see the Buddha. So, well, in our exchanges, sometimes, I think, all of us had somewhat strong egos, and uh, we didn't see eye to eye on everything. And so sometimes I would leave some feeling somewhat frustrated. And one day, I thought, I want to see the Buddha. I want to see the Buddha's guidance. So I go out to the, uh, the great sacred hall in our headquarters in Tokyo. And I go there to go and greet the Buddha and seek his guidance. But as I get to the front door, I notice it's closed. And this was just the day before the big climb. And I was, I felt, and I think I just had missed it a few, by a few minutes, too. So I started thinking about, what does this mean? I can't see the Buddha before I go. And I look up, and in front of the Great Sacred Hall's entrance, right before you, you go in, there's a staircase. And right at the top there are these three paintings of different bodhisattvas, important bodhisattvas that you find in the Lotus Sutra, Maitreya, Manjushri, and in the center, Universal Wisdom. Well, Universal Wisdom was just staring down at me as I looked right up. He was in the middle. And I recalled Universal Wisdom, this phrase, Universal wisdom is known as the Bodhisattva of practice. How we practice it. That's why it's central, because that's so important for us. But as I looked at him, I recalled that, that phrase. Closing my eyes, I see the Buddhas, but when I open them, I lose sight of them. So, I was looking for the statue. <laughs> statue, right? There, there's the Buddha. Buddha, guide me. But he was closed. And I felt later I realized how lucky I was that he was closed. Because it allowed me to realize what I'm not supposed to be looking at is the statue. What I'm supposed to be looking at the Buddha's outside. That chapter goes on to say that as you further and further your practice, you begin to see Buddhas all around you. What does that mean? means that we begin to see the Buddha nature coming out of each person, in each thing. So the next day as I climbed the mountain, we were all dressed in our white, <laughs> very uh, pure um, pilgrimage garb, and we climbed that mountain, chanted the Daimoku, and I really felt at that moment I was walking with Buddha. We were all walking together at the same beat, chanting the Daimoku. And it was very powerful. At that point, I could see, yes, the Buddhas were here with me. One thing I noticed as I was writing this out, this particular talk, I realized that when you start to type the word Buddhas with an S, it comes up as an error. Now, uh, this, I think, is also the thinking of society. Now, not necessarily just Buddha, but, say, God. Well, maybe God, whichever, sure, but... Um, but the idea that there are multiple, right, that there is 
something beyond this, this some thing outside is kind of hard to grasp. For <laughs> some, we don't see that there's not just. If we're thinking that this Buddha is the only Buddha of in Buddhism, then I think we need to learn a little bit more, try to understand a little bit more about what is the real message of Buddhism. So. But the reality is, we're all, we're all born into this world, newborn babies, very pure, not tainted by anger or greed. You ever seen a baby with an angry face? <laughs> you have? I've seen sad faces, but like a shrewd-looking face, you know, or you know, kind of non-trusting face. I don't see that too many of babies. <laughs> Maybe you have, I don't know. I, I've never seen a baby that looks that way. Because that's our true nature. Just like that newborn baby. We're all shining with that light. And this is the Buddha's wisdom. So being able to see all things with that shining light, that is what it means to see the Buddha. Seeing the Buddha really means to direct our hearts to the Dharma. Connect directly with the Dharma. The truth that the Buddha is within and without us at all times. The problem is, of course, it's very hard to see. And it says it multiple times in our Lotus Sutra, often in chapter 16, which we just read, and it's very rare to see the Buddha. When we start seeing him everywhere, we lose sight of how rare it is to see the Buddha. It's something that takes great practice to be able to see. It really is just a way of changing our perspective of things. So, say for example, right? I'll show you this pen. This is a pen, right? Looks like a right, marker. Right. You look at it like this, still a marker. Right? But what if you look at it like this? Maybe you can't tell from far away, at least. <laughs> is, this a, is this a marker? Could be some kind of laser pen or something. Who knows? But my point is, it really understanding the Dharma means being able to see things in different aspects. Being able to see not just our own single point of view, but all views. So, how do we cultivate that? It starts with the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra is our guide. Source. It helps us correct our vision. And so, as we practice, read, recite, and understand the Lotus Sutra, we start to see that these glasses start to form <laughs> of themselves around our eyes. So, this is the world of the wonderful dark. Just as it is. A world of compassion. This world already is a pure land, just as it is. Everything, everything that happens to us is the compassion of the Buddha. By simply doing bodhisattva practice with others, we can receive many unexpected merits. Unexpected merits. And what I mean by unexpected merits is not that you know, it just comes all of a sudden. You know that you're doing good. So good stuff will come to you. But it doesn't necessarily have to come the way you think it will. But it will come up. This is a reality. As we practice and do good bodhisattva practice for others, good things will come of themselves unexpected. And the effect, the effect to all our causes, it's always taken care of. We don't have to worry about it. The Buddha will arrange for it. What's more important is that we focus on our own being a good cause for ourselves. And being a good cause means recognizing that we are connected with others. And we can say, you know, look at our relationships, for example. Uh, my, my husband, he never listens to me. Uh, my son, he's so lazy. Want to get a job. 
Or how other people, say those who are, uh, say a little child who's trying to get your attention. Right? Or an elderly lady who needs help putting her baggage up in the, in the airplane storage area. What about the guy that, that just cuts you off in traffic? Or the co the co-worker who always notices your shortcomings and lets you know about them? These are all the Buddha. All of these. They're all the Buddha. Sometimes we don't want to see them like that. But what the Buddha is there for is not just to say, hey, good job. The time. But the Buddha is there to have us look at ourselves and see areas that we need to develop. That little child, right? Maybe I don't usually notice me. I just go about my life. Ah, uh, old lady can't put her bags in the away. Oh well, you know, I'm sure she'll figure it out. Or somebody crosses in front of you, you get upset. As we see these things, we come to see, oh, this is an opportunity for me to recognize I'm, I'm going too fast, right? Oh, I'm, I'm stubborn. Oh, I'm only thinking about myself, right? Oh, I don't like to have people tell me my shortcomings, right? These types of things, gradually, through our interactions with others, we become more aware of. And we can grow, come to see, ah, oh, it's the Buddha. So, being able to see that everything is the compassion of the Buddha, that's real happiness right there. That's being able to understand the reality of this world. Not being able to see it, on the other hand, that's what makes us suffer. And most of those sufferings come from relationships closest to us. Creating peace in the family and, our, and in our own daily relations is the main point of Buddhist practice. The main point. Because we are all fundamentally interconnected our own happiness can be measured by the happiness of those around us. So sometimes we might be thinking on a very big scale, but it always starts with our immediate relations. Mother Teresa said, when you want the world to be in peace, go home and love your family. When we want world peace, what we first have to do is go home and take care of those around us. By starting with small things at the home, it can carry an influence that can affect the world. It's also the hardest thing to do, as I'm sure many of you know from experience. We just have to find somehow the good in others. Seek that Buddha nature out. <laughs> Cast you out. <laughs> And we do that by praise and giving thanks. Praise and giving thanks. These are means of removing those personal barriers that get in the way. And it helps to create or recreate those strong connections with others. President Iwano said that praise is the first step to revealing the Buddha nature in others. And this is because you are seeing the Buddha aspect in them and making them aware of it. That part of you, that's the Buddha nature right there. Even if it's just one percent, only one percent of that person, you can't see anything and everything else is bad, but just that one percent, you say, okay, that person has one percent visible Buddha nature. I'm going to just let go of all the rest of that and venerate that. But sometimes there's cases where you don't even see that one person. <laughs> there's, there's, there's nothing good about that person. Well, in those cases, right, we don't have to look at the person. But what we have to do is look through that person and see 
that fundamental Buddha nature that exists in me. Well, sometimes we get too much caught up in the idea that it's just the person right there. But ultimately, as I mentioned, we all have that Buddha nature. So venerating that is enough. In the Lotus Sutra, The Life and Soul of Buddhism, founder Niwano states, we can conclude that Buddhism is the teaching that discovers the Buddha nature possessed by all people, discloses it, and polishes it. That's what it's about. Buddhism is solely for the purpose of bringing out your Buddha nature and polishing it. After all, that's what the purpose is, right? To become a Buddha. But to become, if you can't see that you have a Buddha nature, it's very hard to become a Buddha. We all have something to learn from everyone, young or small, I'm sorry, young or old, smart or not so smart, etc. The Buddha shows that it's important to value the people in front of us and to learn from them, looking at them just like they are the Buddha. They're teaching you all the time. After all, we never know who will be the Bodhisattva for us, who will help us see our own precious Buddha natures. Thank you.